Um, okay, so uh, this summer school, there are courses about all kinds of trendy topics, you know, uh, blockchains, machine learning, non-volatile memory. Uh, I'm going to be talking about the stuff of old people, so relational databases. Uh, you may still remember what these are. Uh, these are names like uh, SQL Server, Oracle, MySQL, Postgres, and they still run like a large portion of the modern IT infrastructure. So they're kind of important. Uh, what these systems do is they process uh, uh, database transactions that are submitted by clients. Um, okay, let me remember, remind you uh, what a transaction is. Uh, so it's a, a sequence of database operations that are executed as an, indivi in the, is an indivisible unit, right? So for example, uh, let's say we have Alice and Bob and Alice wants to uh, transfer 20 euros to Bob, then uh, the database would have to execute a bunch of operations like read the current balance of Alice, uh, check that it's, there is enough money in it, so it's above 20, uh, then s uh, subtract uh, 20 uh, from Alice's balance, then read Bob's balance, add 20 to Bob's balance, and then uh, write that into the database. Um, and so the idea is that this uh, whole sequence of operations should be executed indivisibly. Now what people mean by indivisibly is usually formulated using these ACID properties. So this is an acronym you may still remember uh, from your database class. Uh, there are different properties here. So for example, durability says that if you finish the transaction, then it shouldn't get lost after that. Um, in this course, I'm going to be interested in uh, letter I. Uh, so that stands for isolation. And uh, what that says is that the transaction behaves as it were, it were operating alone uh, with the whole database to itself. Um, now to explain this, uh, let's take an example. Let's say uh, Bob has another friend, uh, say Carol. And Carol also wants to uh, transfer 20 euros to Bob. Uh, then to do this, uh, you know, the database would have to do pretty much the same sequence of operations. You know, do something, subtract uh, 20 euros from Carol's balance, and add them to Bob's balance. Now, our Ideally, uh, we want to have 40 at the end, right? And to achieve this, usually the database has to ensure that the transaction execu executes as if it whole, has a whole database to itself. So first we execute one transaction and then the other. Um, now to do this, the database needs to do some work. Uh, for example, if we have our, this kind of an interleaving, uh, let's see what happens here. Um, we, let's say Bob's balance is initially zero, so then our, uh, the database would read Bob's balance, so that's zero, that's on the left-hand side. Um, and then let's say after this we'll do the read on the right hand side. So the uh, database also wants to do the transfer from Carol, so it reads Bob's balance again, it's zero. Uh, and then the database would compute our, what it needs to write uh, to Bob, and on the left hand side we would compute 20. And on the right hand side we'll also compute 20, and so that's what we write into our database. So we've just lost uh, 20 euros. All right, so if you don't uh, control the interleaving in any way, then uh, you won't ensure anything like isolation. Okay, um, and uh, these ACID properties, they're defined a bit vaguely, uh, so usually often people uh, talk about consistency to mean, this, mean the same thing, right? Um, now, uh, you may be surprised, but if you run any of these databases that I mentioned on the previous slide, uh, depending on the settings, you might actually get an outcome 20 and not 40 uh, in this case. Uh, and that's because the database, uh, the databases uh, sometimes provide a bit uh, weaker isolation guarantees than executing each transaction kind of completely in isolation from concurrent transactions. Um, instead, you may hear people talking about uh, isolation levels. Uh, so levels here means uh, to what extent uh, you may observe some weirdness uh, due to concurrent execution of transactions. And so you may uh, hear words like serializability, snapshot isolation, read committed. And so serializability is a classical R. Uh, uh, definition that uh, actually expresses the solution that everything is all right, that each transaction is completely isolated, and then the other terms are weaker. Um, and so in this course, I'll uh, tell you a bit about uh, these kinds of levels. So there are actually quite a few of them are, uh, uh, so the, I grabbed this picture from the internet, so, so I guess there are too many, maybe, are, and so they sometimes form these hierarchies when one is weaker than the other. Um, and uh, historically, uh, the specifications of these levels, levels are often ambiguous or plain wrong. And as a consequence, uh, there is kind of like a history of confusion in the area where you, if you, even if you talk to database engineers, uh, they're often confused about some things. Or you can talk to a person and uh, this person would understand one thing under a term and another person would understand something else. And so in this course, I'll try to uh, clarify a bit uh, these kinds of confusions. 
Uh, one uh, sort of division you may hear about is uh, strong versus weak consistency or strong versus weak isolation. So these uh, kinds of isolation levels, uh, they go into two classes. Uh, one class is strong consistency where are, you know, you don't see a lot of weirdness. Uh, so these are, you know, names like serializability or strict serializability. Uh, and if you still remember uh, the course on linearizability from Monday, then uh, these are criteria that are analogous to linearizability, but for the setting with transactions. And then there is weak consistency, uh, which are these uh, weaker levels like snaps isolation and all that, uh, that allow a bit more uh, strange behaviors. Um, generally speaking, uh, if you weaken consistency, uh, you get better performance. Uh, but there are never-ending fights in both industry or academia about uh, whether this is, this is an appropriate trade-off or, or if we, it's worth making, then to what extent. And so I'll tell you a bit about uh, this story. Um, and just to put things into context a bit, uh, in this course I'm going to focus on like classical databases with transactions, but the same issues occur in other settings as well. Uh, so one setting is uh, just multiprocessors and programming languages for concurrent programming. Uh, so pretty much anything you may think of, Intel, ARM, the common programming languages, uh, they also usually provide very strange semantics for concurrent programs. And uh, you may remember some things that were said at the non-volatile lecture about that you need fences in some cases because of reorderings. And so again, this is, these are the same issues that just occur as what I'm going to talk about uh, in the context of databases, uh, just occurring in, our, uh, in another setting. Um, and then another uh, setting where this is common is uh, NoSQL data stores. So when people sort of said, oh, we, we're going to get off relational databases and use our, you know, some more primitive uh, programming models, they also got rid of a lot of isolation or consistency guarantees. And so you may hear words like uh, eventually consistent, which no one quite knows what it means. But uh, so these are the even more extreme versions of what I'm going to be talking about. Um, in this course, I'll focus, I have to, have to make a choice. I'll focus on one thing. Are uh, the classical databases uh, because this kind of bread and butter of uh, computer science. Um, and so in this course, I'll uh, explain uh, some of the popular isolation levels, in particular serializability, snapshot isolation, and some of the weaker levels. Um, I'll highlight some of the confusions and pitfalls uh, that people have when they are often work in this area. Um, and so that uh, it was a bit more entertaining and not just a sequence of strange examples, I'll also talk a bit about, just a bit about implementations, like how you actually implement uh, this or that level. Okay, um, and so this is kind of the introductory part. I'm happy to take questions, so please interrupt me if uh, something is unclear. Um, first, I'll uh, talk a bit more precisely about what I mean by isolation level, so very, very quickly. Um, so our, when you have your database, it may be a super duper, super optimized database. Maybe it's running in the cloud, maybe it's like distributed, it has many replicas. Um, but when a customer uh, interacts with this database and executes transactions, uh, then uh, when he thinks about whether you know, his application is correct, he doesn't really care about all this fanciness. Uh, all he cares about is that, well, they, these customers, they submit transactions and they need to know uh, what kind of behaviors they will get. And so an isolation level uh, defines the set of uh, client visible behaviors uh, that the database is allowed to produce. Right, so if we look at the, you know, the clients do, submitting transactions and the implementation of the database, then we kind of draw a line here. And uh, when we talk about isolation, we only talk about uh, what's observable uh, to the clients, not uh, database internal details. This is going to be a very important distinction in my talk. And to make this a bit more formal, uh, the way I'm going to talk about these uh, client visible behaviors is using a notion of our history. So history is a, uh, a record of interactions between the clients and the database uh, in a single execution. Uh, so here is, here's the example of a history on the left. Uh, so we have a bunch of transactions. Um, and in the history records, uh, which transactions the, cli the clients did, uh, which operations they did in transactions, uh, the values these operations returned, and whether each transaction commits or aborts. Right, so you may recall that transactions may sometimes abort because of failures or, or something else, uh, and so we have to record this. Um, now, to make this talk a bit simpler, even though I'm talking about relational databases, uh, I'll stick uh, as, as much as possible to the usual key value store model. So, so I, unless necessary, I will not be writing 
uh, SQL statements uh, on the slides. Instead, I'm going to talk about uh, just reads and writes to some objects. So I, I'm going to assume that the database contains a set of keys or objects. Um, and I can, uh, for example, read the value uh, from an object x and get 0. So that's what this rx0 means. Or I may uh, write a value uh, 1 to object x. So I'm going to record operations like this. Um, and then, of course, I have also commits and uh, abort. Okay, um, and uh, I'll add some more stuff to histories later, but uh, I will never add anything performance related. So this is just about correctness, what kind of uh, return values clients may get from the database. Okay, so uh, so now a history is a uh, records interactions uh, between the clients and the database in a single execution. Uh, then an isolation level, uh, it records the set of all histories that the database is allowed to produce. Right, so what kind of behaviors uh, this database may get if clients submit transactions. Um, and so you can view it as a contract between the database developer and the uh, clients uh, that are writing applications using this database. Um, and, uh, and we can use this definition to compare isolation levels. So, our, so iso an isolation level is a set of all histories that the database can produce. So then we can say that one level, L1, is uh, stronger uh, than another level, L2, uh, is the set of histories, uh, so the set of possible behaviors that L1 is allowed to produce, is a subset of the set of histories that L2 is allowed to produce. Right? And uh, if we take these common levels, like serializability, snapshot isolation, all that, uh, then the strength goes this way. So uh, the more histories uh, you allow, uh, the weaker guarantees you provide, right? and the fewer histories you allow, the stronger guarantees you provide. And if, you're, if these orderings are confusing, then you may think about a database that just returns a completely arbitrary responses to any query. So then, of course, it's over here uh, on this side because it uh, produces all possible histories. Right? Um, and as I said, the weaker guarantees usually are lead to a better performance, but uh, the kind of it depends on whom you ask. There are lots of arguments about this. Um, and when I showed you this slide with uh, 50 shades of consistency, then uh, these arrows, they actually uh, mean that one level, so this one is weaker than this level. So it kind of goes all the way, and serializability is up there at the top because it's one of the stronger levels. Um, Okay, so uh, is this, uh, before I continue, is, is this clear or are there any questions? Because uh, these comparisons are going to be useful in the future. Uh, okay, great. So let me go on. So I'll start with serializability. Uh, so I'm going to go over the definition first. So this is a, uh, a strong isolation level. So sometimes people talk about uh, when talk, people talk about serializability, they say it's strong consistency. Now, as I'm going to explain, it's not actually the strongest. Uh, so there will be some controversies. Um, and so, okay, so I need to define what it is. Now, remember, an isolation level is a set of all histories uh, that the database is allowed pr to produce. Uh, so here's the definition of serializability. Uh, let's say we have a history H, like uh, the one that I uh, used as an example before. Uh, then H is serializable. Uh, if it's committed transactions can be totally ordered uh, so that the result is a valid sequential execution of these operations. Okay, so let's parse this a bit. Uh, so I need to check if this history is serializable or not. Uh, so the serializability only constrains committed transactions. It says nothing about aborted transactions. So I need to kick out uh, the aborted transactions. So T2 goes away. Uh, then I need to look at the remaining transactions. That's uh, T1 and T3. And I need to figure out if it's possible to order them in some way uh, so that I get a valid sequential execution of these reads and writes. Right, so in this case, I can order them like this. to T1 goes first, uh, T3 goes uh, next. And then I need to check that this is a valid sequential execution. So what do I mean by that? That means that if I look at every read in this execution, uh, it should uh, fetch uh, the latest value uh, written to this object uh, by the preceding write. Right. So, for example, if I look at this read, uh, so this read reads 1, and if we look at uh, from x, and if we look at the previous writes to x, the previous write to x is that one, and uh, you get 1 there. Uh, then the next read is from y, or if I, it fetches 2, and indeed there is a, uh, a write over here that gets 2. Uh, and then there is read of uh, 0 from x, so I assume that 0 is the initial value, so if there are no writes, then I should get 0. Uh, and so this history is serializable because I, I managed to find an ordering uh, that gives me a valid sequential execution. Right? If I don't manage to find this ordering, uh, then the history is not serializable. Okay? 
Um, and then uh, a database is serializable if it only produces serializable histories, so histories that satisfy this definition. Okay, uh, so uh, any questions about this definition? Uh, yeah, there's actually database people, they don't much talk about program order. Uh, they have something called session order and session guarantee, so I, I'll talk about this uh, at the end. But actually the classical definition, there is no, they just put all the transactions into one bag. Uh, so yes, yeah, so this is one of the controversies about the definition. Um, okay, uh, so okay, I'll assume that's clear. And now uh, the one thing is that this is a very convenient programming model because it allows uh, the clients of the database uh, to completely abstract from the database parallelism. Uh, so I may have my you know super duper highly optimized database. Uh, of course, it won't execute transactions sequentially. You know, you have multi-core machines. You know, cloud, whatever, right? Um, then. Uh, I get a guarantee, so serializability says that any history produced by this real op optimized database implementation uh, can also be produced by your grandfather's database uh, that processes one transaction at a time. Okay, so transactions are processed completely sequentially. And so that's great for clients of the database because uh, if I'm a client and I'm worried does my application using this database satisfy some correctness prop TP, uh, then uh, I can just check this prop TP assuming that uh, I'm using the grandfather's database to just process transactions sequentially, right? And because any history that this, are, that this real database uh, is covered by the set of histories of the sequential database, uh, then if this check uh, passes, then I'm also sure that the, when I'm using the actual database, uh, I will, uh, I'll, my application will satisfy uh, this prop TP, right? So that's great. Okay, and now, uh, so as uh, uh, you uh, said, there are kind of more things you may want from this definition, and so it's actually somewhat controversial. So I'll explain uh, what the uh, what these are. So now, are uh, so, so as I said, you may hear people say, "Oh, you know, it's serializable, so therefore it's strong consistency." Uh, but actually, uh, serializability by itself is not the strongest thing you may uh, want to have. Are uh, in particular one one reason is that it provides absolutely no guarantees. Uh, about the values read, it, read by aborted transactions, right? So the definition says that the history is serializable if the committed transactions are such that, you know, blah, 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 right? you get a valid sequential execution, right? It says nothing about the aborted transactions. Uh, so in principle, database can just uh, feed uh, complete rubbish into aborted transactions, uh, sorry, into transactions, as long as it aborts them later. And uh, this is sometimes okay. Uh, for example, you have stored procedures because there, then the database has a complete control over transaction execution. So if the uh, if something wrong happens, it can also always abort the transaction. But it may lead to problems in external code when you are da using database, say from Java, uh, because you know you may the programmer may do things like are uh, you know so read the value x from the database and then compute y by dividing one over x. And the programmer may think that since he, you know, if you never write zero to x, then this is always safe to do. Now, if you're using a serializable database, then uh, there is nothing that tells you that x will not be zero. Right? It cannot can be zero as long as the database aborts the transaction later. Then in this case, you'll throw an exception way earlier than that, and you know, crash your application. Uh, so yeah. Uh, no, because what may happen is uh, you may execute in an in, in interactive transaction, you may execute one operation after the other, get the reads, and then you ask the database to commit it, right? And the, so you have to say commit transaction now. And then the database may validate what it's, actually there are implementations that work like this. So, so it will validate all the reads that it gave you, and if these reads were rubbish, or it will abort the transaction. And there are implementations that actually gain performance by this. They, they serve you kind of reads that are not, uh, don't correspond to any sequential execution because later they, you know, if you're lucky, then you'll get correct reads and then you'll commit. If not, you'll abort. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I think that's where, I mean, stored, pr okay, I'm not a, like a super expert. I think stored procedures are kind of not, not too used, right? Uh, yeah, you do not submit the entire transactions. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, and so, 
so this is one limitation of serializability, and there is something called opacity, which I'm not going to cover, but it's a stronger isolation level that actually does constrain uh, the behavior of aborted transactions. So I'm giving you this uh, just to illustrate the kind of con you know the uh, the controversies that surround these kinds of isolation definitions, and sometimes. Um, these controversies get a bit comical. Uh, for example, there was uh, this paper uh, in 2015. So, as I said, there was a lot of there were a lot of fights in industry and academia whether we want to weaken consistency or we want to have strong consistency. And so, these guys from Microsoft they uh, they did a very fancy database using like RDMA and all kinds of fancy stuff and said no compromises. You know, we'll give you strong consistency. So, so they meant serializability by that and you know great performance. You know, you don't have to weaken consistency. So then what happened is they, uh, they tried to deploy it in production to do a graph database based on it. And the problem is that these databases provi provided serializability, but not opacity. So it did what I described to you before, like validated reads at the end. And they found out that the programmers weren't quite happy with it because you, know, you have a graph and you're traversing it and suddenly you get an edge that leads to nowhere and it throws an exception. And so they had to write, you know, four years later, they had to write another paper, which is essentially corrects the previous one and uh, to provide opacity. And uh, one of the co-authors, he told me that they had a hard time coming up with the title for the second paper because the first paper said that you know, they, they, they make no compromises. Um, so the moral of the story is when somebody says strong consistency, you have to read the fine print to see what they mean. And you shouldn't believe tree huggers who say, you know, all weak consistency is, you know, evil. You should only do strong consistency because when they say strong consistency, chances are they don't know what they're talking about. Even without strong consistency, there are like different uh, shades. Okay. So that's, uh, that's one controversy. Uh, okay. Uh, controversy number two. Uh, so serializability is a safety property, it's not a liveness property, if in case you heard these terms before. Uh, so serializability says that uh, committed transactions, uh, they have to produce correct outcomes, but it doesn't prescribe whether a transaction are, has to commit or abort. For example, a database that always aborts all transactions is serializable. Right, so it's not very useful, right? Um, now there are, so, so yeah, so like programming languages people, they would say that serializability is a safety property. So that it ensures that bad things don't happen. You, if you, the transactions that commit, they don't produce our incorrect outcomes. Uh, now you can complement it with liveness properties uh, that guarantee that our some transaction is under certain conditions will always commit, it will not abort. Uh, and so you may hear these are kind of similar properties to what you see in like uh, concurrent data structures, weight freedom, abstraction freedom. Uh, but frankly speaking, you don't see much of this stuff in the database literature. So, so you just don't care. They, you know, they just try not to do stupid things like abort all transactions. Okay, and then uh, last thing, uh, which is something that I'll uh, go back uh, to at the end of the course, uh, is our okay. So, do people still remember what uh, linear? Let me uh, let me remove this. Do, do people still remember what linearizability is from the, or did everybody drink too much in the night intervening nights? So, can you know, can anybody explain to me the difference between serializability and linearizability? Uh, if you know the definition of serializability is here. And you may still remember what linearizability is. Okay, so I don't know, maybe you, you raised your hand first, so. Uh, I guess linearizability is when you know, like all the uh, kind of properties of Okay, that, that's one difference, yeah. So, okay, so one difference is uh, what you said. Another difference is just uh, linearizability is for concurrent objects and serializability is for transactions. Right, so just the API is a bit different, right? Linearizability is you do a, you know, operations one, two, and other third one, right? Serializability you do one batch of operations, which is a transaction, another batch of operations, which is transactions. You need to check if uh, if that's uh, okay. So that's one difference. And another difference is what you said, which is uh, there is no, our, you know, I didn't talk about real-time order preservation or anything. So, so you, these database people, when they originally defined serials ability, they said you have a bag of transactions, they should be executed in some order, but you have no idea which order it is. And I'll come back to this at the end of the talk, so I'll talk a bit about uh, criteria, isolation criteria that actually uh, do take into account uh, real-time order. Okay. Um, okay, any questions uh, so far? Uh, okay. Uh, okay, so then uh, let me uh, say a few words about how you implement serializability. Uh, so this is, you know, one thing just 
so that you, you there was a bit of concreteness here and another thing is I'm gonna actually use this implementation uh, later when talking about weak consistency levels. Okay, so uh, if we wanna implement serializability, we have to ensure this picture, right? So any history produced by the real database implementation is produced by a sequential, can be produced by a sequential database implementation. Now, of course, one implementation is you can just literally process transactions sequentially, but it's not terribly efficient. Uh, so instead, we'll add a bit more concurrency. Uh, but as I showed you before in the previous, you know, one of the previous slides, you need to be careful with concurrency control because otherwise you'll do things like uh, losing 20 euros. Um, and so the classical algorithm for this is called uh, strict to phase locking. Uh, you can ignore the word strict, it's somewhat historical, so sometimes people say oh, just two-phase locking. And it's really a textbook implementation of, of serializability. Uh, it's also used in commercial databases. So the idea here is that each object in the database is protected by a read-write lock. Uh, so remember here I, uh, I decided to you know, evade as much as possible uh, relations in SQL. So I just have objects and uh, they have names X, Y, right? And so here I'm going to say, well, each object is protected by a read-write lock. Uh, now what is a read-write lock? Uh, the usual locks, they, are, they have just one mode. You acquire the lock and while you hold it, no one else can get the lock, right? So it's exclusive. A read-write lock uh, has two modes, a uh, read mode and a write mode. They're also called share and exclusive. And the idea is that uh, the conflict relation is like what, what's shown in this table. So if I hold the lock in the right mode, so these are two transactions. One holds uh, the lock in this mode, uh, the other holds the lock in this mode, and uh, cross and take correspond to whether they can concurrently do this or not. Right? So, so this means that two transactions cannot hold uh, the lock uh, concurrently in the right mode. And if one transaction holds the lock in the right mode, then the other transaction uh, can't hold it in the read mode either, right? So if I have the same here, symmetric, right? So if I have a lock in the write mode, then nobody can hold the lock, this lock at all in, in any mode, read or write. But multiple transactions may hold this lock um, in the read mode, right? Uh, so this allows a bit better concurrency where when people are reading, they can actually access the object concurrently. So this, if this is a bit vague, uh, I'm going to just show you the algorithm and then this will become clear. Okay, so each object is protected by read-write lock. And the way you're going to implement a transaction is a, well, the transaction executes a sequence of operations. Uh, so what you'll do is before doing each operation, uh, you'll acquire the corresponding lock, right? So if you have a client that starts some transaction, say T1, uh, then if he wants to, if this client wants to read an object, it will have to acquire the lock in the, for X, for this object in the read mode and then do the read. And then if he, if he wants to write to some other object, say Y, then it will have to lock Y in the write mode and then do the write. Uh, and these locks are held until the transaction commits to abort, so until the end of a transaction. You want to do an operation, you acquire a lock and you hold it until the end of the transaction. And so then finally, when the client finishes the transaction, then it will, will ask the database to commit it and then it will unlock these locks. And so the reason why it's called two-phase locking is that there are two phases here, one where you keep accumulating locks, right? so you do operations and you're acquiring the locks, and then the other phase is when you are done and you release the locks. Okay? Um, so let's see a bit on an example how this helps uh, with concurrency control. Let's say we have another uh, client over here who wants to uh, do another transaction, uh, T2. And let's say this client, uh, first she wants to uh, read an object X. So then she tries to acquire uh, the lock uh, for X in the read mode. And uh, so I'm assuming the interleaving is as shown on the slide, right? So uh, by that time, the first client already holds the lock uh, for X in the read mode. But that's not a problem because multiple people may hold uh, a read-write lock in the read mode. Uh, so this uh, client may actually, can actually do the operation, right? So she will read uh, the object X. And then uh, when she wants, let's say now she wants to also write uh, to the object Y, so she needs to acquire the lock in the write mode. But by that time, uh, the first client, he holds the lock for Y, for y in the write mode as well. And so that means the, uh, you know, you, only one transaction can hold the lock uh, in the write mode at a time. Uh, so the, uh, this lady on the left, on the right, uh, she cannot acquire this lock. She will have to wait instead until the uh, first guy uh, releases the lock on Y. So this will happen when the first transaction commits. And so only then uh, will uh, the second client be able to do the write to Y. And then at the end, she will commit the transaction and unlock these locks. Okay, so this is how our, it helps with managing concurrency, this use of read-write locks. 
Uh, any questions about this algorithm? Clear? Yes? Okay, this is the next slide. Okay. So, any other questions? Okay, so yeah, so great. As, as you said, uh, you may get into issues because uh, you get into DAG locks if you acquire locks in different orders, right? So the first guy may acquire uh, the lock uh, for X in the right mode, do the operation, then the second guy may acquire the lock for right, uh, for Y in the right mode, uh, do the operation, and then if they try to acquire each other's lock, uh, then uh, both of these acquisitions will hang because the lock is held by the other guy, and so here you have a deadlock. And so if you implement strict uh, two-phase locking, then you need to have some kind of a mechanism uh, for deadlock detection. Um, so the mechanism can be anything. I'm not going to you know, talk in detail about this. You know, one simple thing is just to have a timeout. Uh, right? So if you can't acquire a lock for a while, then you say there must be a deadlock. And in the solution in this case, you will abort one of these transactions. Right, so uh, if we have a deadlock, or so let me go over this again. Right, so if we have a deadlock here because these guys try to acquire uh, locks in different orders, then we'll select one of these transactions as a victim, say T1, and abort it. Uh, so that means uh, the database will un undo it up its updates, uh, release the locks that it holds, and then the second client will actually be able to acquire uh, the lock for X uh, and proceed. And the second one may actually uh, finish. Okay, sorry. Okay, so this is the uh, uh, this is the two-phase locking. Uh, so it's a classical algorithm, and I'll use it a bit to illustrate things. Uh, now, uh, let me just sketch intuitively why this actually in does ensure a serializability. So I'm not going to do a formal proof, but I'll give you some uh, intuition. So why strict two-phase locking produces only serializable histories. Um, so let's look at an example. Let's say we have a transaction that uh, reads an object X and writes an object Y, right? Then when, it, when they, the transaction does each of these operations, uh, it acquires the corresponding lock in the read or write mode. Right, so uh, if you look at the write, uh, so as remember, a write lock, if you hold it, nobody else can, uh, can hold it at the same time. So this ensures that uh, starting from the time until uh, the database, uh, until the transaction uh, did this write, and until the transaction tries to commit, uh, nobody accesses Y at all. Right, uh, right. So this, this is because uh, you hold the locks until uh, the end of the transaction, right? And similarly with the uh, read uh, of X, right? So here you have a guarantee that nobody modifies X because our, uh, this guy is holding this lock in the for X in the read mode, and nobody can concurrently hold this lock in the write mode. That means that nobody can overwrite uh, this object. Uh, and this means that um, if I read this object X here or here or at the end of the transaction, I'm going to get the same value. So all my reads that I have been doing during the lifetime of the transaction, uh, they will give me the same values as if uh, I did them uh, when I started to, to, com to commit the transaction. Um, and same for writes. Nobody accesses Y, so nobody can see my write. Uh, until I read or write this object, uh, until I'm done, uh, so until I reach the end of the transaction. So it's as if this write happened at this point. And so as a consequence, uh, transaction produces the same results as if you executed it atomically at the time when the commit starts at this point. Uh, and that means that the, you can pick as the serialization uh, the order of commit calls. Right? So the serializability requires you to produce an order that gives you a sequential execution, uh, and this order is the order of uh, the times when you try to commit the start the commit of the transaction. Okay. Um, so this is just the intuition. It's not the formal proof, but uh, you know, hopefully it will help. Uh, any questions? I can see some confused faces. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. It's a new transaction. It's a new transaction. Okay. Okay. So now um, let me. So, so you'd better understand because it's going to be a quiz in the next slides. So I, this is important. Okay. So now I'm going to talk about uh, something called anomalies. These are these weird behaviors that are allowed by weaker uh, isolation levels, but are disallowed by serializability. And so at first I will not talk about anything weak. I'll just go over these examples and we'll check why serializability doesn't allow them. And I'll ask you to explain to me why two-phase locking doesn't produce them, right? So that's you better understand the algorithm. 
right? And they are, uh, and so these anomalies, they usually expose the effects of database parallelism to the client. So these are things like, you know, losing 20 euros. Uh, and they're important because they're often litmus tests for uh, checking database correctness, right? So when you have bug reports for databases, they often say that the database allows this or that example. Uh, so these examples go by canonical names. Uh, so the first one is called Dirty Read. Uh, there are like four or five, so I won't bore you too much. Right, so the first one is Dirty Read. Uh, the, the names are canonical, so if you talk to a database person and say Dirty Read, he will understand what you, what you are saying. Uh, so the example goes as follows. We, we have two transactions, T1 and T2. Uh, so T1 uh, does an operation, say so writes 1 to X, uh, and then aborts. And T2 uh, reads 1 from X and then commits. Right, so I'm assuming that the initial values are zero, so that means that uh, T2 read the value that was written by an aborted transaction. That's why it's called a uh, dirty read. And it's not serializable because our, you know, uh, you know, okay, so serializability says I have to order committed transactions so that the result is a valid sequential ex execution, so I have to throw away T1, look at T2. If I look at it, it's not a valid sequential execution because the initial value of X is zero and I'm reading one, okay? Now, uh, can anybody explain to me why what's the, why two-phase locking doesn't allow this? Uh, yeah. Two-phase locking does not allow this because uh, when one can be seen only while T1 holds the right block on uh, X, but then the T2 won't be able to read X because it needs to take the read block. Yeah, exactly. So uh, T1, in two-phase locking, T1 locks X over here before doing the write and maintains it until uh, the, the end of the transaction, right? And at the end, it's ab an abort, so uh, at the end, this update is gonna be undone, right? And so uh, there is no way T2 can see this because T2 needs a read lock and uh, T1 is holding a write lock uh, for the duration when this value exists in the database. Okay, great. Um, then the next example is what's called unrepeatable read. Uh, so you have, uh, again, T1 that uh, writes one to X and then commits, and then T2 that reads X twice, and the first time it doesn't see uh, the write by T1, so it reads zero. And the second time it reads this object again, and now it sees one, right? Okay, so our, so T2 first, sees some, first doesn't see something, and then suddenly it sees it, right? Okay, so that's not serializable. Uh, okay, let's see why. Uh, so both transactions commit, so I have to order them in some way. Uh, now T2, it read zero from X, so it didn't see this right at first, that means that I must order T2 before T1, right? Otherwise, you know, this read wouldn't, uh, wouldn't work, right? But if I order it and look at it as a sequential execution, then I cannot read one here because the right to one is over here, right? So uh, I cannot get this, um, right? And, uh, uh, okay, so it's not serializable because uh, if you read something that fixes the snapshot of what you read, right? You cannot suddenly have new stuff appearing, right? Now, so somebody else, maybe somebody else rather than this guy can explain to me why, what's the mechanism, for, yeah. Uh, um, if you two-phase locking, as you first read the, the X, you put the phase Yeah. Yeah, correct. So uh, so before the, in the in the example before it was about write logs, right? And here it's about read logs, right? So when I uh, when I remove like when I read something, I take a read log uh, and hold it till the end of the transaction. That ensures nobody can modify it because they cannot concurrently acquire write log, uh, right? Okay. Um, okay, then let me uh, write the next example. This one is uses SQL. Uh, so this is a, and so it's called phantom read, and this is something, again, the canonical name. Uh, it's essentially unrepeatable read in the relational model. So what happens here is T1, instead of writing something into some object or row, it inserts a new row into a table. It inserts a row into some table with some value, say one. And then T2, it does two selects from this table. So it says, list, list me all the records in this table. And the first select uh, gets you an empty set of records, so there's nothing in there. And the second one actually uh, sees, the, um, uh, sees this uh, record that was inserted by T1, right? Uh, again, it's not serializable, uh, right? And it's kind of similar to the previous example. The only difference is it's not about changing the value of a single object, it's more like inserting new or rows or objects into the database, right? So I'm giving this uh, to you just because people often mention phantom read when, when they talk about these databases. And implementation, another, another reason why this is important, actually avoiding this requires a very heavy performance penalty, and this is one of the major uh, 
reasons why people don't like serializability or strong consistency uh, as far as performance is concerned. Because in this example, okay, I showed you this uh, two-phase locking in the simple key value store model. But if you are, want to prohibit this example, uh, this T2 will have to hold the lock on the whole table right, for the duration of the transactions. Nobody can insert anything at all in this table, right? And now imagine if you had here had some complicated search conditions and wouldn't help you, uh, you know, all that much because you cannot like statically say, you know, which records will or will not satisfy this condition, right? So this is one of the major reasons uh, why serializability is expensive uh, to implement. Okay, um, and then, uh, okay, here's another example. Um, <coughs> it's called reads cube. So uh, this one and another one, and then I'm, I'm done with this example, so you will not be uh, too bored. Um, so this one, uh, okay, so T1 does two writes, uh, write to X, write to Y of the values one. And then T2Cs are uh, write to X, but not write to Y. Okay, so it's kind of sees uh, part of what is written by, by some transactions. It's also called fractured read uh, for this reason. Right, it's not serializable, of course, because, well, I, uh, if I have to order these guys uh, somehow uh, and to get a valid sequential execution, well, I have a uh, read of uh, x of 1 here, right of 1 of x here, so t2 sees the write by t1. That means that uh, t2 has to come after t1. Uh, but then, uh, you know, if I look at what this should give me in the sequential execution, then, of course, I should get 1 and not, uh, not 0. Right, and in uh, two-phase locking, our, so, so here I'm just gonna not ask you, just go over this quickly, right? So you get a, uh, you have that uh, T1 uh, when it writes to X, it locks X for writing and keeps the lock until commit, until it's done all its writes, which means that T2 cannot uh, even do this read. It will have to to do this read. It will have to wait our. Uh, for this whole transaction to execute, only then it will be able to do the read of x and y, and but then it will also uh, fetch the correct value of y. Yeah. Is it true that the default uh, value for x1 for x is zero and for y is zero also? Yes. So, so, so again, sorry, default I could. Values. Oh, default values are zero. Yeah. So in all examples, I assume default values are zero. So again, so just. Okay, and finally, there is uh, the last example. This is just the uh, variant of uh, this thing with losing 20 euros. I'll go over it quickly. It's called lost update. Uh, so here we have two transactions, uh, and essentially they allow they arise from a code that does x plus plus in both cases. But the way it looks at the database level is you first read the value of x, so which is zero, the default value. Then you compute the new value that's one, and then you write that to the database. Right, so you write one. In this case, uh, one of the increments is lost because you would expect to get uh, two and not one at the end. Right, um, and. Uh, and of course, this is not serializable because if I order these transactions in any way, say t1 and then uh, t1 first, t2 second, uh, and they're identical, so I can order them in any way I want. Then, uh, you know, I will get an incorrect value of this read because uh, you have a preceding write uh, of one to x, right? And so, on the serializability, you are if you execute x plus plus twice, you actually get uh, two. And in two-phase locking, okay, we don't have to talk about this now after all these examples, but essentially, you, because you, you lock everything, uh, this will not happen. Okay, um, so this is the anomaly checklist so far. Uh, so we have these dirty read, unrepeatable read, read skew, lost updates, and they're all uh, disallowed by uh, serializability. Uh, so again, these are like litmus tests for quickly checking database correctness. When there are bug reports, people often say that, oh, you, we observe unrepeatable read under this isolation level that's not supposed to, to do this. Um, now, actually, testing I databases are for satisfying things like serializability or other isolation level is pretty difficult because uh, checking serializability in general is an NP hard. Right, so it's just hard to do this efficiently, uh, right? And uh, in fact, this is something that's not very well tested often in databases. Uh, and there is a whole industry of uh, recently of people, uh, so both in industry and academia, who do tools for database testing for specifically isolation levels. Because for many years, uh, there's been like an underserved uh, area. So one of them is called uh, Kyle Kinsbury. Uh, he's, he's a fun guy, as you can see from, from this slide. And he has this tool called Jepson. Um, that essentially executes uh, the system in a, in the database in an adversarial environment, gets the histories, and then checks them uh, 
against the specification of the isolation levels. And they have some ways of or how to make this check uh, more efficient. And so he's like a nemesis of, uh, of databases. So he has all these bug reports saying, you know, Postgres, Mongo, Cockroach, and they're all, you know, broken in all these different ways. You know, the, 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 you know this anomaly, that anomaly, right? And they also have, if, I'm not going to talk about checking serialized booty, but if, if you're interested, uh, they have a VLDB paper where they actually explain how they do this. All right, so this is just a, a bit of a sidetrack. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about uh, weak isolation levels. Uh, so serialized boot is expensive, right? Because uh, you have to produce uh, you, pr you have to produce the solution of sequentiality, and no matter how fancy your concurrency control algorithm is, uh, you'll still have to or make sacrifices for this. So you have all this locking, right? I, as I explained, for phantom reads, you have to lock like some cases like the whole table, which is very expensive. And so uh, what happens is commercial databases they actually provide instead a range of weak isolation levels, right? So this is what people call like weak consistency. And the funny thing is that serialized boot is uh, usually not the default and sometimes it's just plain unavailable. Uh, so this is a table I took from a paper uh, from 2013, uh, so a while ago, but actually nothing has, not much has changed since then, so I think this is still valid. Uh, and this lists the different databases, their default isolation levels, and the maximum isolation level they provide. Uh, and so I'll just go over some uh, characters from this table that, that I'll refer to uh, later. So if you're using SQL Server, for example, that, then you're you're lucky in the sense that uh, you can get serialized boot if you really want to, but the default level is read committed, which is something very weak, and I'm gonna talk about this later. Uh, if you use Oracle, you're less lucky. Uh, you don't even get serialized boot at all. You get something else called snapshot isolation, so I'm gonna talk about it next. Um, and then there are a couple of other databases that I will often refer to as um, kind of as use cases, and uh, one is Postgres, uh, so these are two open source databases. One is Postgres, uh, so this again has read committed uh, as default, so as booty as maximum. Another one is MySQL. Uh, so this has some something stronger as default repeatable read and serialized boot is maximum uh, if you want to if you want to get it. And so these Postgres and MySQL they are like uh, top open source uh, databases. Uh, jokes uh, that if you are a startup and you can you want to use a database you can get any you want as long as it's MySQL or Postgres. So I'm gonna uh, you know use this as a as a, as examples. You know I've seen this in some industry talk, right? Um, and this is not exactly a new thing. This started in 1976. Uh, when a bunch of gray famous people, including uh, Jim Gray, who's sort of like a legend in databases, uh, wrote this paper where they said, well, you know, this two-phase locking is so expensive, let's just re release locks earlier. Right, so that's why I went through all these examples before. I said so this example, oh, the, the, you know, it's prohibited because you hold this lock for a long time, and therefore, you know, nobody can see what you're doing. Right, so what they did is they said, well, we re will release locks. Uh, uh, earlier and uh, it'll get strange behavior, but you know, well, you know, I guess well, the computers were slow back then, so I guess it was, you know, even papers were typeset like this, so, so I guess it was justified, um, right? Uh, and then, uh, so it was 1976, and then in uh, 1992, uh, there was a SQL standard, so NSI SQL. Right, so you may often hear this word. Uh, and they tried to uh, at least standardize these levels, so they came up with these. Uh, Names, so read committed, read uncommitted, repeatable read, serializable, okay, serializable is classical, the other ones they, uh, they kind of uh, they introduced. Um, and uh, they did it in actually uh, quite a strange way. Uh, the way they defined them is essentially using examples. So they, they would have these tables, like the one I showed here, uh, and it would list some anomalies, so like dirty read, uh, fuzzy read is the same as unrepeatable read, so this is something that I showed you, right, phantom. And they said, oh, you know, if you have something like read out committed, so it's a very weak level, then it allows all of these anomalies. And if you have serializable, then uh, you disallow all these anomalies. Uh, now, this is a broken because it's too lax, right? It's just, you know, defining specification by examples is not very good, uh, right? So I showed you lost update, right, as an example. But, you know, I can produce hundreds of examples like this that are kind of all similar but slightly different, right? So you somehow need to disallow them all in one go. Right, and so uh, later, like three years later in 1995, uh, again a bunch of famous people uh, wrote a paper saying, you know, a critique of NSI SQL isolation levels, uh, where they tried to fix it. Uh, they also got it wrong because they, um, their definitions were too restrictive. They were very much in the mindset of log-based implementations. Uh, and so they essentially talked in terms of logs, uh, let's say. Uh, and there are many different implementations that sometimes don't use logs. Um, and so our, if the final uh, definition that sort of assumed, uh, accepted to be correct was given by Atul Adia uh, a, in a paper in 2000, but that was very late. 
So by that time, uh, the database manufacturers were doing whatever the hell they wanted, right? And the note of caution, so this will become clear as I talk through the next slides, uh, that these NSI SQL levels are often just words, right? So you need to, for each database, when it says, I provide you read, uh, read committed or repeatable read, you need to ask yourself, what, what does it actually provide, right? So look at kind of uh, the fine print. Right? Okay, and so I'm not going to start with these very weak levels. I'll start with something called uh, snapshot isolation, uh, which is a sort of a more sensible level, and that's actually very popular. Okay, so I know, I, are there any questions about this so far uh, before I go on? You know, drink water in the meantime. Mm -hmm. so, say again, what? Uh, f fuzzy read is the same as unrepeatable read. It's just different terminology. Okay, any other questions? <clears throat> okay, then snapshot isolation. Uh, so this is just one notch weaker than serializability, right? So, so that means that uh, the set of histories that are allowed under snapshot isolation is just a bit bigger uh, than the ones that are allowed by serializability. So remember the the direction goes this way. The more histories you allow, the weaker guarantees you provide, and the fewer histories you allow, the strong guarantees that you give. Uh, now, snapshot isolation is provided by Oracle as serializable. Uh, that's actually how they did it. Uh, what they did is they, uh, they just implemented something first, uh, and then, well, it was serializable in the sense that it disallowed the list of anomalies in the ANSI standard. Right, and then they said, oh, well, actually, it's not serializable, so it's something else, but anyway, we'll use its uh, keyword and size SQL serializable, right? So when in SQL, using Oracle, you write uh, SQL serializable, you don't get serializable, you get snapshot isolation, which is what I'm going to present to you. Uh, the correct definition was given in this paper that I, uh, that I talked about, so this paper got various things wrong, but one thing they got right is they defined uh, snapshot isolation. <coughs> um, and it's provided uh, by, in Postgres as repeatable read. Okay, and uh, until 2020, this wasn't even clear. The documentation was sort of very vague. And then after that, Carl Kingsbury guy uh, that I, in the leather suit uh, did some testing uh, and wrote a kind of not very complimentary blog post, then they, they fixed the implementation. Sorry, they fixed the documentation. Um, and for example, in MySQL, repeatable read is something completely different, so I'm gonna talk about this slightly later. Okay, so here's the definition of SI. Uh, now, uh, it's going to be a bit interesting now because uh, serializability, I define it as a declarative condition that's kind of like a logical formula, right? So, I, you know, give me a history and here's a logical formula that you have to check in order to, to see if this history is serializable or not, right? That, you know, you have to order committed transactions in some sequential order, et cetera, et cetera. So, snapshot isolation is defined by an abstract algorithm. And the, uh, our, the set of histories uh, that snapshot isolation allows is the set of histories produced by this algorithm. Uh, so the algorithm kind of serves as a, a reference implementation. Uh, it, this algorithm is a bit non-deterministic, so some decisions are underspecified, right? So this is to give the, the flexibility to implementations. Um, and uh, the declarative specifications for SI also exist, uh, so we did some work about this at some point, uh, but they require more, more math machinery, so I'm not gonna go into this, right? So I, I'm gonna give you the, uh, the classical definition. Okay, um, so let's, uh, to see how this works, uh, let's a bit recast the, remember what serializability, how serializability can be defined, right? So we say it's serializ database is serializable if every history it produces is serializable. Um, and this has a bit of an operational intuition, right? So this means that if I have our history H produced by the real database implementation, then this history um, also has to be produced uh, by the sequential database implementation. So by a naive database that just processes uh, uh, transactions sequentially. This is like the reference implementation for serializability, right? So to define snapshot isolation, what I'm gonna do is instead of the sequential database, I'm gonna put this abstract uh, SI algorithm, right? That I'm gonna describe now, right? And then my database is gonna be SI if every history it produces, so this real database implementation uh, can be also produced by, uh, by the algorithm A, this abstract algorithm that I'm, that I'm defining. Um, and this is still kind of nice because if I'm a client and I'm using uh, a snapshot isolation database, that means that I don't have to think about how it's actually implemented. I just can check that uh, my application satisfies some whatever correctness property P I want, assuming uh, that the database is actually implemented using this abstract algorithm, right? And that means that because of you know, this inclusion on histories, uh, that means that this property P will also be satisfied uh, by the uh, application when it uses the actual database. Okay, 
Um, and one thing to say is I kind of emphasized at the beginning that it's important to distinguish specifications from implementation. So here I may seem like I'm contradicting myself because I'm talking about in, you know, in some abstract implementation. Uh, there is no contradiction because uh, this implementation, the real one, may be completely different from this abstract algorithm. So this abstract algorithm is just a way to define the set of allowed histories. Uh, although in practice, of course, it will use some ideas from this abstract algorithm, even though it may be way more optimized than that. Okay, so now let's start uh, with the algorithm. Uh, so this algorithm falls into a class of what's called multi-version optimistic concurrency control. So you may remember about this from your database class. If not, I'm gonna explain what it is. Uh, so it's something that's uh, pretty good for reads, which is why people like uh, this isolation level for performance reasons. Uh, the idea here is that uh, it, the database stores multiple versions of each object and each uh, version is distinguished uh, by some unique identifier, right? So for example, the database may look like this, where I have you know, object X, it has value one, and that was written with version one, right? So this was value that was written at some point, and then at some point somebody also wrote uh, value 42 into X, and that's version two, and then there is value Y that is zero, and that's version one, et cetera, right? So the database, instead of like before with uh, strict to phase locking, the database just contained the one set of values for each object. Here you have multi-versioning. So for each object, you have multiple versions at the time that were written by different transactions, and you hold on to all of them. Right? And the idea here is that transactions are going to be executed optimistically. Right? So we'll try to execute them, and we won't try to uh, store our writes into the database. Uh, and then uh, when the transaction commits, then we'll decide whether it you know, actually commits or aborts. And if it commits, then we'll add uh, the rights to the database <coughs> and tag them with some unique version number uh, to distinguish from others. Okay, so let me make this a bit more concrete. So uh, the way I'm gonna <coughs> uh, distinguish these versions, so these identifiers that I mentioned, uh, is using what's called timestamps. Uh, now they're called timestamps because uh, they're kind of like a virtual time used by the algorithm. Uh, they don't have to come from real time, although in some implementations they do. So formally speaking, they're just integers. Um, and there are two timestamps associated with each transaction. So there is the uh, start timestamp, so start TS of T. Uh, that has to be computed before uh, the first read of uh, T. And you may think of it as kind of like a time when the transaction starts. Right? And then there is the other timestamp, which is called the commit timestamp, uh, commit TS of T. Uh, so that's computed at commit time. Uh, it has to be unique uh, and greater than all existing timestamps in the database. Uh, and this is what I'm going to use to tag versions with. Right? And so the idea is that if I execute a transaction, then when transaction does its write, say uh, one to object X or two to object Y, uh, then these writes, they are not stored in the database. They're just buffered for a while. And then if the transaction commits, uh, then we add these writes uh, to the database and we tag them with the commit timestamp of this transaction. So this will allow us to distinguish our, these writes from others that are around. Right? And the writes are added atomically, right? So it's as if nothing happens uh, as far as writes are concerned until the end of the transaction. At the end of the transaction, you store everything you did in, in, in the database. Okay. Uh, okay, now let's uh, let's see how our how the algorithm actually uh, uses these timestamps. So the most important thing here is how you serve reads, and for this uh, I'm going to use the start timestamp. So what happens is the start ts of t, so start timestamp, it defines the snapshot of the database uh, consisting of all writes by all committed transactions uh, t prime. Uh, that have commit timestamp of t prime uh, less than the start timestamp of t, right? So let's go over this example. So let's say we have transaction t, so it uh, has a start timestamp over here, right? And let's say at some point it does a read uh, from an object x, and I need to figure out uh, which value this transaction is going to fetch, right? Well, to do this, I need to look at all the transactions uh, that have commit timestamp less than the start timestamp of t, right? So all these transactions over here, so in particular this one uh, falls into uh, the snapshot, right? So these transactions, they define the snapshot, and the transaction, so this one, it will serve uh, reads uh, from the snapshot defined by the start ts, so all the transactions that are on the left, plus its own right. So let me unpack this, uh, what this means. So uh, there are two cases. One case is uh, this transaction t, it has already written something to object x, right? So it's reading x, and before that it's written something to x, maybe twice. So for example, here it wrote one, here it wrote two. 
Uh, then in this case, uh, if t has written to x before, it will fetch the last value it wrote. Right? So in this case, the result is going to be 2. And so your own writes over, always supersede uh, what's in the database. Right? Um, and then there is the other case, uh, right? So if you, sorry, if you have like this transaction, for example, row three, you ignore that. So this, super, this two supersedes, right? And then there is the other case, which is our, the transaction T didn't write anything to X uh, before you did this read. In this case, uh, what you're gonna do is you look at all the transactions that committed before the start timestamp of this transaction. So that have commit timestamp less than it, right? And you fetch the last, uh, the latest value written according to these commit timestamps, right? And so, for example, in this example is going to be three. If I have a bunch of other transactions, for example, there's another transaction that wrote four at some point, but its commit timestamp is smaller than the commit timestamp of this transaction that wrote three, I'm still going to get three because I'm always taking the, uh, the latest uh, version, okay? Um, Okay, so, so now is the time to ask questions about this rule because this is like the most important thing here and you really need to understand it. Yeah. The, the, what's hey? Data skew? Uh, well, there's something called right skew that I'm going to talk about later. Uh, so data, maybe you, data skew, I don't know the term, but uh, maybe it's the same. What do you mean? Okay. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna present, I haven't yet finished the algorithm, so I'm gonna present the algorithm, then I'm gonna explain sort of what kind of examples you may get that are weird here, right, uh, yeah. Uh, well, I, I didn't exactly, or it's not exactly defined, it's just the algorithm when it commits the transaction, so it's an abstract algorithm, right, I'm not showing you pseudocode, Right, I'm just showing you some pretty pictures, right? But essentially you can write the pseudocode. And the commit TS, the way it's gonna define it, when the transaction is time to commit, uh, the algorithm would non-deterministically select a commit timestamp in any way, as long as it satisfies these properties, or it has to be unique. I mean, this is unique just to distinguish because where you're gonna use it to tag versions, so it's just to distinguish from other versions. It has to be greater than all existing timestamps. Of all the previous transactions, right? This is just to maintain the illusion of virtual time, right? If you commit now, you should happen after, kind of your time to su supersede everything that happened before in the database, right? Uh, yeah. Is it correct that you are doing productively transactions in C3? Well, as I, uh, there is no chance that when I, there are some on the fly transactions that you were previously not participating. Uh, no, everything that is our, uh, uh, everything, oh, let me go to the, uh, okay, so everything that is, uh, happened before this time, so everything that has a commit timestamp less than the start timestamp of T is visible, okay, everything that committed, okay. One example, so, so let me show you, like, actually I should go through this example. On the other hand, if you have a transaction that committed over here, right, so between the start timestamp of this transaction, and the time when it did the read, this transaction is ignored, right? So anything that's on the, uh, it's on the fly, at the moment I'm doing the read, that's just ignored, right? I only take into account what I definitely know is committed and committed before this uh, start timestamp, okay? Yeah, yeah, so this algorithm assumes, well, I mean, the, these transactions, they may have, well, this, these transactions, they may happen, they may be executing concurrently here, right? I mean, in one machine, right? So this is one machine, Right? But the transactions may be executing, so multiple transactions may be executing concurrently. Right? Yeah, but, but look, I'm giving you an abstract algorithm that's like this before, I, because I said so, right? This is the definition, right? Now, this algorithm is, is uh, executes on one machine, right? Now, there are implementations that, of course, in practice, there are implementations of multiple machines. They will have to simulate this, al this algorithm, right? So they will have to produce behaviors that match this algorithm, right? But this is really the definition. I'm going to give you a bit of intuition later why it's like this, but, you know, really, the, it's just like this, right? So, okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, commit time, then it uh, writes uh, object x 
and uh, process handle. Mm -hmm. So another process start new. No, 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 sorry, sorry. I, I should have made it clear. This is an abstract algorithm. Every handle is executed atomically. Okay. Now, of course, it's not terribly realistic, but this is not a realistic implementation, right? It's like an abstract machine. So, 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 so sorry, when I say, you know, you commit, when this pick commit timestamp, add writes to the database, tag them, this is all done atomically in one step, right? But you may still have interleavings of different transactions, right? I can make commit this transaction, you know, like here, right? I may start this transaction, then something commits, then I read this, so I need to decide what do I do with this, right? So this is not a database that processes transactions sequentially, right? Okay, any other questions? Ne ne next. Uh, next is going to be something different. You mean you went previous? This one? Correct. Yeah. I, I'm gonna just wait. I haven't yet shown you the full algorithm because I'm gonna validate at the end. Here, this is what we discussed before. Just, just wait. Okay, wait for me to to finish. Then I'll uh, then I'll. Uh, okay, just ask this question after two slides. Okay, uh, okay. Okay, sure, sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And this is the set of the rest of trees and tiles. Yeah. And it seems to me that this is equivalent to, to say, let's assign two linearization points of that function, one for the global reads and one for the the operation. And then, and this is being the execution of that. Uh, it's kind of you, you can think of it like this, yes. But but there is also there is this write conflict detection I'm going to talk about now. That's a bit you know that breaks this a bit, right? So but uh, okay, let me maybe let me finish describing the algorithm. Okay. So 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 far I'm, I I just need one more slide to describe the algorithm. Right? So far I've described you the rule for reads, right? How you serve reads. Uh, let me just show you the close. first. Let me just briefly list the consequences of the good things that this allow this guarantees, right? At least this guarantees that I have no dirty reads because I always read from committed transactions, right? So all the transactions that are on the fly that I haven't yet committed, I just ignore them, right? Okay, then I have no unrepeatable reads because the snapshot is fixed uh, once you compute the start uh, TS, right? So the snapshot is determined by start TS. It's all the transactions that commit, com whose commit times are less than start, start time timestamp. So once I determine start TS, that's it, right? I always read from the snapshot, no unrepeatable reads. And no read skew, right? Because if I, the, whether I see something or not is determined just by timestamps, right? So whether if one transaction wrote to objects X and Y, uh, both versions will get the same uh, version number, the commit timestamp of this transaction. So I will check whether I see those versions based on how that commit timestamp relates to my star start timestamp, right? So I cannot see uh, one of them, but not the other. So this is great. At least I'm disallowing these kind of really stupid examples. And uh, these reads, so the, the nice thing about all this multi-versioning, so the reason why I need multi-versioning is so that I could uh, get a read consistent with a given start timestamp. And so the nice thing about this, I don't need read locks. So that's why people love snapshot isolation, right? And in particular, when you're in relational model and you want to disallow phantoms, you don't need to do things like uh, locking the whole table, at least for reading. Okay, so that's why people like this, okay? Okay, so these are the nice things, and now let me describe the one final piece of this algorithm. This is write conflict detection, right? So I've told you how I uh, serve reads. Uh, I just need to tell you what checks I do at commit time, right? So at commit time, if, I'm, if the client asks me to commit the transaction, uh, I don't just uh, go and commit it straight away. I do something called write conflict detection. Okay, so here's the rule. So let's say I have a transaction T. Uh, it's associated with the start timestamp uh, and the commit timestamp. So I kind of have like a, a lifetime of this transaction from here to here, right? Uh, so I will only commit this transaction T uh, if there is no other, okay, sorry. And let's say this transaction T did some writes, right? So for example, it wrote uh, one to X. Right. Then I will only commit this transaction T 
uh, if the following check passes. So I have to look at the lifetime of this transaction at the interval from the start timestamp to the commit timestamp of this transaction. And, in, and I need to see if there is another transaction uh, that committed in this interval, so whose commit timestamp falls into this interval, uh, that also wrote to the same object uh, that I wrote. Okay? So uh, here I wrote x. I look at the lifetime of this transaction. <coughs> if, I are, if, so, if some transaction wrote to x uh, already, I cannot commit. I, I will abort. Right? Um, and uh, uh, so let me actually, uh, let me quickly uh, skip. Why, why, why is it good? Uh, it's good because it disallows lost updates. So this is something that we really don't want to happen. So let's see why. Right, so let's go over this example. Right, So lost update is these uh, two increments and one increment gets lost because we, in both cases, we read, z read zero and write one right, instead of two. Uh, so now let's see. These transactions, they have to uh, commit in some order. So if, uh, if for this example to happen, well, let's say uh, you know T prime are the second transaction committed before uh, the first one, just to be concrete, right? Um, now uh, let's look at the uh, time when the second trans or this transaction commits, right? The the latest one, the last one, right? So it wrote to X, right? So it kind of wants to add this right to the database, right? Uh, then our okay, uh, we know that uh, this transaction T. A read zero from X, so it didn't see the write of one by transaction T prime. That means that the uh, start timestamp of T must be less than the commit timestamp of T prime. So the start timestamp of T must be on the left of T prime because if it were over here, uh, then T would have read one and not zero, right? We always read uh, what's on the left of the start timestamp, right? So, but then we have this conflict detection, right? That when we commit a uh, transaction T, we have to look at its uh, lifetime, so the interval from its start timestamp uh, to commit timestamp, and we need to check if there is another transaction, in this case T prime, that also wrote the same to the same object as T x. So there is a transaction like this, and so that means that uh, T will have to abort, and this example will not happen. Okay. Oh, because I don't do, okay, I actually had a, a slide about this, because there is no read conflict detection. So there is write conflict detection in the sense that I'm checking uh, writes of this transaction against writes of other transactions. I'm not validating the reads of this transaction, right? So the reads of this transaction are served at the, uh, kind of like at the point of the snapshot, right? And I'm not checking that they are the same at the commit point. Right, so our so read validation would be low. so the transaction can commit, but right? It's no, no. So look at this example, right? So so let's say transaction T read uh, zero something from X. Let's say zero, and then there is another transaction that committed our uh, something to some transaction that wrote to the subject X. Right, could be here, could even be here, right? Uh, then uh, this transaction T will commit. There is nothing that would prevent uh, prevent it from committing, right? And actually, if I add this uh, rule, like the read conflict detection, I would be just implementing serializability. Okay, now in pa if Panagiota is confused, then I guess I should go slower. Uh, so. Uh <coughs> No, no, sorry, it, it, it can, but in this case, uh, T will abort, right? The, so the, what I mean is I, okay, let me go over the rule again, right? <coughs> sorry. Uh, so the rule is, uh, I, if, when I want to commit T, right, I assign it a commit timestamp, I'm attempting to commit it, right? And then I look at this interval and I see, has there already been a transaction that committed in, in this interval and wrote to the same object as T? If there is such a transaction, I abort T, so I throw it away. Uh, what Panagiota hasn't finished nodding, so so let's see. Yes, okay, okay, fine. Yeah. Uh, so. <laughs>
same algorithm, but we will use the same different signals that will allow us to uh, read and write our data, but not to read, but not, not to write and write. Um, <clears throat> kind of. So here, sometimes people implement snapshot. People sometimes implement this by instead of you know executing and then checking it at commit time, just acquiring write logs uh, for objects they write. Right. So for example, here I can uh, write. I can just acquire write log and then hold it until the end. That ensures that this check will passes will pass. You can do it like this. There are implementations that work like this. Right. It's so a practical implement. It will comply. You can prove that they're cool and right. In terms of possible like performance is whatever it is, it's different. But in terms of behaviors, they're cool and yeah, um, right. And so this kind of goes back to again, if you remember something from your database class, there are these two approaches to implementing transactions: so pessimistic and optimistic, right? So pessimistic is using locking. So two-phase locking is like this, right? So right, and you can do an implementation of serializability. Uh, use also optimistically, right? And it, you would get exactly this. You would use exactly this algorithm, including this read conflict detection rule that I that I showed you uh, over here, right? That you instead of just validating writes, you would also uh, validate the reads. If this transaction read something, you would have to check at commit time if this if these reads are the same, right? So so in two phase locking, you hold the lock here. And you make sure that nobody can uh, modify, so this check definitely passes. You can also do just keep executing, right? And at commit time, check has this read been validated? If uh, not, great, I can commit. If yes, then okay, I'll abort, right? So these are two dif different approaches. They're equivalent in terms of behaviors. They both implement serializability. Have different performance characteristics. There are big, big fights whether you want to be pessimistic or optimistic when you implement actual databases. So what they did to invent snapshot isolation is they took as a starting point this uh, multi-version uh, algorithm for serializability and they deleted this rule, which is uh, read conflict detection. Okay. Well, I mean, I don't know. You know, you're still taking locks is also not, not too simple because you, you right. This is not. Uh, I mean, I'm showing you this in the key value store model, but in the relational model, you need to have predicate locks, and you know, this, this is not uh, not simple either. Uh, people more when people decide whether they want to go pessimistic, optimistic, they decide based on more like performance uh, characteristics, right? So you know, you want for example here one nice thing is that in in snapshot isolation. Okay, so this is only true for snap states and no serializability is that read-only transactions always commit, right? Because I don't validate any read. If I have a read-only transaction, I read from a snapshot, get to the end, uh, the write conflict detection passes because you know, there's no, no, there are no writes, right? So it will commit. Right? So people make these kinds of trade-offs. Okay, uh, any other questions? Yeah. My question is the oh, okay. This one? Exactly. So it would take no if if they both start before they both can meet, it, it prohibits um, like a linear write for Yeah, oh, well so it's not like it prohibits, but you may get a behavior that is not serializable. No, but my, my like no. Uh, no, no, not really. Let, let's go over this. Uh, maybe let's go over this example, and then we can uh, maybe we can play. I mean, th I sh I'm gonna. Sh well, I need to explain to everybody what this example is. So, so I'm gonna show how it occurs. I think if we, you know, tweak things a bit, then we can also show how it mean, you know, will not occur in some cases, right? So, our okay, well, you look confused. I mean, they, so the, okay. Anyway, so let, 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 let me continue for a bit more. Okay. Um, okay, so this is a uh, so what we were talking about is the example that's called right skew, and this is a typical non-serializable behavior uh, that is allowed by snapshot isolation. 
right? So I uh, listed you the nice things that this allows, you know, dirty reads and repeatable reads and all kinds of things, right? So this is something that it does allow, right? So uh, here's an example. Um, so there are some operations they arise from this code. And uh, to make it a bit more fun, I kind of, you may kind of think of it as, so X and Y, uh, these are Boolean variables that represent whether a given engineer uh, in your software development org is on vacation or not. Uh, and what you want is that uh, somebody is always left for on call. So if something breaks down, you know, this guy will get woken up in the middle of the night. Okay, so that means uh, the invariant is, uh, okay, so if uh, X is zero, um, that means the, what is it, yeah, the engineer is available, right? So if X is one, that means the engineer X is on vacation, right? So I want to maintain an invariant that either X is zero or Y is zero, right? And uh, here we have a code that, so there are two transactions, they arise from the same piece of code. Uh, so we have our, we first, so we want to send a Y on vacation. So what we do is we check if uh, X is available. And if X is available, we say, well, then, then Y can go on vacation, right? So that's all right. And the other piece of code uh, does kind of a symmetric thing. So you, we want to send X on vacation, right? And uh, we say, well, if our uh, Y is available, uh, then X can go on vacation, right? So this is if X and these two engineers, they submit requests saying, I want to go on vacation. The system checks, is the other guy available? If so, uh, okay, fine, you can, you can go on vacation. And so the problem here is that in both cases, uh, these requests succeed. So you uh, read uh, zero from X, so like X is available, then you write one to Y and you commit. This is this transaction. And this transaction, you read uh, zero from Y uh, you write one to X and then you commit, right? And then in the end, both uh, guys go on vacation, right? So this is uh, this called write scheme. Um, so let's see why it's not serializable, uh, first of all. So um, we need to order these transactions uh, in some way. Uh, so let's say we order T1 before T2, just uh, for to be concrete. Uh, right then, our, well, I don't get a valid ex sequential execution because here I'm reading zero from Y and there was a write of one to y, so, so I shouldn't read zero, I should read one. And you get the similar thing with the reverse order, right? So if you get t2 before, put t2 before t1, then uh, the write to, the read from x is invalid because I'm reading zero and there was a write of one to x, right? So, so this transaction, uh, in this transaction, uh, x got sent on vacation, right? And we're reading uh, so x is zero as if x is available, right? And so it's not serializable. Uh, and it's kind of like the two transactions, they don't see each other's right. Uh, okay, and it may happen with snapshot isolation. So it doesn't have to happen, but may happen, right? So what mean, okay. So what happens is, uh, let's say how it may happen, right? So let's say I execute these transactions in parallel. So I have to assign start timestamps. Uh, let's say I assign timestamp one to T1, timestamp two to T2. Uh, and then these are two transactions will do the read. Okay, in both cases, there are no writes uh, before the snapshot, before the start times, right? So they will both read zero. So T1 reads X, it reads zero. T2 reads Y, it reads uh, zero. Uh, and then they will do their writes, okay? They can always do writes because writes don't go initially into the database, right? So what the writes will go the, to the database only at the commit time, right? And so are the uh, commit, let's say we commit T1 first, and then we, let's say we assign uh, the time, the commit timestamp uh, three. Right, so then, uh, okay, we have the uh, con this write conflict detection rule that requires us to look at uh, the lifetime of this transaction and check uh, have there been uh, any writes uh, to the object that uh, T1 is writing, in this case Y, and there haven't been any writes, uh, right? So there was a write by T1, but uh, T2 it wrote to X, it didn't write to Y, right? So uh, in this case, uh, fine, th this transaction can uh, can commit, right? And then. The second transaction, it will maybe let's say it commits later. We assign commit timestamp four, and again we have to do the same check. Look at its lifetime, so the interval from the start timestamp until the commit timestamp, and see if there are any writes to the objects that it wrote to. Well, the, the, the object that it wrote to is X, uh, so it wrote to, to it over here, and T1 it wrote to Y, it didn't write to X, so uh, there are no conflicting writes, and so this transaction uh, again commits, right? Um, and so the uh, weird thing here is that uh, because I have no read conflict detection, uh, th so this transaction, the first one, could commit and write uh, the write to Y to the database. Um, sorry, did I wait, 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 wait. Oh, sorry, the, the second transaction, no, I got it wrong. So the second transaction T2, it commits 
even though it read Y, and this read got invalidated during its execution because somebody, or another transaction T1, uh, wrote a new version of Y in the meantime. Right? Uh, and so this is what's called read conflict detection. It's not turned on in, in snapshot isolation. And so this is the reason why you allow non-serializable behaviors like this one. Okay? And so this anomaly is allowed under snapshot isolation. Um, now, coming back to your question, uh, okay, what I mean, it doesn't happen, have to happen. If I execute this code right over here in a snapshot isolation database, uh, I don't have to get this bad outcome. I might get the good one. There's nothing that prohibits the good outcome, right? What I'm saying is that there is a, there is a case where snapshot isolation basically forces right to zero. Um, so there is some order history so that is to be allowed under uh, serializability but not allowed under... No, no, that, that's not the case. All, all, all serializable histories are allowed under snapshot isolation. Uh, so maybe we could go over it in the coffee break or on, I guess if we write something then it will yes, be... Please. Yeah, okay, fine. Um, okay. Um... Let me see, actually, I yeah, let me just say one more thing and then I'll stop. Uh, and then, uh, okay, so, uh, so there is this weirdness that, um, <clears throat> that here you, uh, there is no read conflict detection, so you don't check if uh, when this transaction commits, you don't check if its uh, reads got invalidated by somebody else. But database actually do give you a way to turn on this conflict detection. So there is something called select for update. <clears throat> so if you implement these operations in SQL, then reads and writes, they're going to be like uh, select and update, right? So, so reads are select, writes is update. There's something called select for update. It's a read, uh, but it forces the database to do some extra validation or to acquire some more locks so that these example, the examples like this are not allowed, right? So if I do implement in T2, <clears throat> if I may implement this read using select for update, uh, then uh, this c uh, here at commit time, uh, the database will actually have to check that our, all the reads by T2, like this one, haven't been invalidated. So there was no other transaction that wrote um, something to this object during the lifetime of this transaction. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> I, I think every, I think it's in the SQL standard. So any SQL uh, any SQL compliant database. Well, well, sorry, sorry. You, you can also like if you like write, just write back the value. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can also just write it. Yeah, write back the value. Correct. Yeah. Uh, I'm. Uh, well, we can we can check, but my recollection, so according to my recollection, it's it's just part of the SQL standard. Yeah, yeah, no, no, but the typical ones, the ones that I kind of highlighted, they do provide, you know, Postgres, MySQL, they, they provide select for update. Okay, uh, let's maybe stop here. Oh, wait. Oh, oh no, there's, okay. Uh, if you implement all your, if you use select for update for all reads, it will be serializable, correct? But the point is that usually the way it's used is not everywhere, right? You say, well, here I don't want write skew to happen, so I will use select for update. Okay, so we'll keep, the questions keep coming, so sorry. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, snap translation is weaker than serialize the other way around. That means it's stronger. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, you're right. I swept this under under the carpet, right? So I wanted to kind of this in the whole course. I only, apart from that slide about opacity, I only talk about committed uh, transactions. But yes, you're right. If you sort of look at the behavior of boarded transactions, then yes, snapshot isolation the way it's defined gives more guarantees. So this is sort of you, you often go into some philosophical arguments so the weeds in these isolation levels where you're like, oh, but if you take aborted transactions, then this provides strong guarantees like what you said. Yeah.
Okay. <clears throat> okay, so we have a half an hour break. Thank you for the first part. Okay. <clears throat>